stop right there. That's right, I see you. Best coming to the open, no use hiding. What have we got here? A large group of people illegally trespassing, illicitly sneaking, unlawfully creeping around a cemetery outside of normal operating hours? If I didn't know any better, I'd say there was some criminal operation happening here. Well, I've got one thing to say to that. I want in. Ugh. It's been absolutely ages since anything has happened around here. And most of my neighbors consist of old farmers and churchgoers. And despite the stories I'm sure you've heard, none of them are that interesting. Don't make for great partners in crime. I've been stuck under six feet of oppressive boredom for years. 97 years to be exact, but I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the end of my story. Now I'm sure you must all be asking yourselves the same thing. Who is this strapping young man whose air and manner suggest such a roguish past, a shifty history, a wily record? Well, pose your pencil and flatten your notepad, sleuth, because here's the name you won't want to forget. Albert A. Hopkins. <sighs> well, if, uh, if, if that name doesn't ring any bells, then perhaps after today, it'll have cause to. Allow me to give you the dissection of the greatest heist ever pulled. Hmm. At least in these quiet corners of Connecticut. As in my personal opinion. <laughs> All right. At least the greatest heist ever pulled by me. Now, let's get down to brass tacks. The agents, Albert A. Hopkins. Yours truly, age 20 years. Born and raised in Brooklyn, well, Connecticut, the Brooklyn, Connecticut. I was the boss of the operation, the Brass Louis of our Bent Brigade, if you will. Then there's Charles Charlie Hopkins, age 18 years, also hailing from Brooklyn. Charlie was my younger brother, my closest pal. This was a two-man operation. The target. The home of one Charles Barstow in Canterbury, Connecticut. Uh, now, Charles wasn't exactly the head of a national bank, but he was the head deacon of a local church, putting him in charge of gathering the offerings and keeping them safe in his home until Monday morning banking hours. The tithes of hundreds of townsfolk amount to one thing, a whole lot of cash. And that was our target. The time. Now this was the ingenious part of Charlie and my little scheme. When can one be sure that the head deacon of church would be out of the house for a lengthy period of time? Ah, uh, yes. Easter Sunday would do just nicely. The how. Now setting the date and picking the target is all well and good for any scam, but it means nothing without a means of execution. And boy, did Charlie and I need one for this. This wasn't some lowly shack. This was a well-maintained home of one of Canterbury's most high-profile residents. No rotten floorboards, no poorly nailed siding, not a loose window on the place. This forced Charlie and me to use all of our careful conniving, all of our unlawful acumen, all of our bootleg brilliance to find a way inside the good deacon's impenetrable abode. So, listen to this. We used a key. <coughs> well, well, you see, uh, two years prior, Deacon Barstow had Charlie do a bit of work on his property and uh, lent him a house key. But I convinced Charlie to hold on to the key. Thought it'd be a nice little ace in the hole for a possible rainy day. I mean, come on, with other kids our age, holding down jobs and getting apprenticeships, we had to do a bit of our own uh, financial planning. So that was the plan, and we more than made good on it. 
Albert and Charlie Hopkins. Dashing brothers and burglars extraordinaire broke into the home of the good deacon Charles Barstow on Easter Sunday, 1921, making off with more than $300. That's more than $4,200 in your modern currency, and more money than Charlie and I had ever had at once, and we intended to put it to good use. So we split, made tracks, kicked the dust of Connecticut off our feet, never looking back. Our plan was to head northwest to New York State, where we could live like kings, and that's exactly what we did for about three months. Turns out when two young men roll into town, neither look like they'd ever done a day of honest work in their lives and start spending like money bugs, it, uh, it tends to attract attention. Uh, which may explain how the copper from Connecticut were able to track us down more than 260 miles away from home. The Hopkins brothers had a short but sweet run. After a speedy trial in our hometown of Brooklyn, Charlie and I found ourselves here in the idyllic town of Cheshire. Specifically, we found ourselves in the slightly less idyllic Connecticut Reformatory, located in Cheshire. Now, Charlie and I were more than a bit nervous. The year was 1921 and most pens were solely punitive in nature, being run by men who cared more for punishment than anything else. But then entered a man unlike any other. Uh, perhaps the only man to earn my respect during my tenure in the big house. George Chester Erskine, the superintendent. Erskine's reformatory was just that, an institution with the singular goal of reforming inmates, a new idea of those living in the year 1921. Now, I already know what you're thinking. Al, you went soft. You had a year and a half of your precious spirited life taken away by some brick box in the middle of a field, and you don't even have the nerve to resent the fat cat that ran the place? Well, to that I say, shut your mouth and let me finish. <laughs> it wasn't that simple. Erskine wasn't your classic brass button jailer. He wanted to help. Erskine's reformatory held young men, ages 16 to 24, and Erskine saw their court-mandated time under his roof as an opportunity to give them the skills they needed to better themselves. So he had his inmates do something a, a little unusual. He had them work, uh, but not the mindless, soul-crushing, break big rocks into small rocks kind of work, though. I'm talking honest-to-goodness industrial-age type jobs auto shops, printing presses, furniture repair, masonry, painting, farming, blacksmithing, and other businesses were all operated under the roof of the Connecticut Reformatory. And these were very much actual businesses that had actual customers. The Cheshire locals used to bring their cars in for a tune-up or, or leave furniture to be repaired. Uh, the money didn't go to the inmates, of course, but it did go towards the reformatory, helping to pay instructors that would train us while well, keep an eye on the boys while they did their work. It sure had made old Erskine proud. <laughs> they would love to tell us stories of inmates that had gone and made something of themselves. <laughs> there was one guy who, after spending three years on the inside, later visited Erskine. A wife on his arm, a healthy savings account behind him, all to ask for a job recommendation. He ended up getting it, too. And as a lead construction foreman, no less. I was almost there, too, you know. I could have been the one to come back in a few years' time with a wife, kids, a job. Don't, don't get me wrong, I did my year and a half inside the clink. Not my best behavior. Uh, well, after, after an adjustment period, of course. I found out I had, a, I had a knack for farm work while I was in there. Enjoyed it, too. I worked at Bishop's Farm after I was released on parole. My brother was out. I had a group of friends. I was making money. <sighs> Things were looking real sweet. Right up until they went sour. 
It was a, a hot summer day in August when a couple of my buddies and I were out swimming in Hotchkiss Pond near Bishops. Now I was a strong swimmer and that's something I took pride in, but the thing was that Hotchkiss Pond, well, it was fed by springs, making for some very cold currents cold enough to induce cramps in even the strongest swimmers. There was uh, nothing I could do as I sunk all the way to the bottom. They, uh, they dragged the pond for two days before they found my body. Notified my parents back home and my brother Charlie in West Hartford only, only Charlie came to identify me. My, uh, my body was supposed to be shipped back home for burial near my family. But it turns out I, uh, was wanted. I mean, come on. What parent wants to shell out the cash just to associate themselves with some screw-up crook? And, and Lord knows my brother didn't have the money for a funeral. Charlie, he was... He was in a good place. I wouldn't want to put that on him. It looked like I was, I was destined for a pauper's grave. But then guess who stepped in to make sure this sad sap got a tombstone? That's right, the Connecticut Reformatory. Even after I was gone, old George was still looking after me. It's still here too. It's a small one, all by itself in the corner over there, near the chain link fence and condos, but it's mine. And I've got the state of Connecticut, Superintendent George Erskine, Charlie, and even Head Deacon Charles Barstow to thank for it. Now, before y'all scram, I'd like to give you two pieces of advice for my 22 year run here on Earth. First, whatever you do, don't, don't get caught. And second, don't, don't throw people away. Even those of us who look like they've sunk down about us as far as they can go. Thank you. Now get out of here.